Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, a large number of Japanese citizens were kidnapped by the North Korean government. They were average people, men and women, young and old, many never being heard from again. Why were they taken, how were they taken, and did any of them ever escape back to their country? Let's dive in. So in my video about Fusako Sano a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that when she originally went missing, her case was suspected of being yet another case where a Japanese citizen was kidnapped by North Korean operatives. A lot of people watching had no idea that that was even a thing, and basically told me in the comments, you know, you can't drop a bomb like that and not elaborate. So since so many of you wanted to hear more about these cases, here I am elaborating. Many people from many different countries have been kidnapped by the North Korean government for various reasons throughout the decades. Although the reasons did vary, many were taken and forced to teach their language and culture to North Korean spies, operatives, and members of government. Out of all of the countries who have had their citizens taken, Japan had a lot taken in particular, with many of them being brazenly snatched up from their hometowns in the middle of the day and taken away to North Korea by boat, never to be seen in their home country again. These kidnappings are believed to have begun in the 1970s, which was the decade when the most of them took place. A lot of people who went missing were mainly taken from beaches, coastal areas, and islands just off the mainland. Many of the people who went missing were very average citizens, both young and old, male and female. It seems that the bulk of them weren't targeted specifically, but instead were taken simply because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Over time, 17 citizens were officially recognized by the Japanese government as being kidnapping victims taken by the North Korean government. But they include over 800 names on their list of possible victims. However, this took some time. In the beginning, the idea that these missing people could have been taken by North Korea was seen as nothing but a conspiracy theory. It was seemingly too fantastic of a story to possibly be true, the Japanese government thought. In hindsight, we know in this day and age to never put it past North Korea to behave in truly erratic ways. But unfortunately, at the time of many of the disappearances, the Japanese government chose to take no action, despite pressure from some groups that strongly asserted that North Korea was the likely culprit in many of these cases. As previously mentioned, many of the victims were taken in order to have someone teach the Japanese language and culture to North Korean spies and various other agents. Some were also taken for the purpose of identity theft. Some were taken even simply because they were witnesses to North Korean activity throughout Japan. Some of the women are suspected of having been taken to be forced into being the wives of Japanese criminals, mainly a group called Yodo, also known as the Japan Red Army, who were based in North Korea at the time. For many of them, their fates are mere speculation at this point, as no information about them has ever leaked and they have never been heard from since their disappearances. As I said, the government currently suspects many, many citizens of being kidnapped by North Korean operatives throughout the years. In fact, they still hold this list of 800 names that may have been taken by the Hermit Kingdom. However, out of all of these hundreds of cases, they only officially recognize a small number of these people, 17 in total, as being surefire victims. As of 2006, the full list of victims includes Yutaka Kume, a man who went missing in 1977 from the Noto Peninsula, an area near the coast. Minoru Tanaka, a man who went missing in 1978. It's said that he was persuaded to go overseas and then later taken to North Korea. Kyoko Matsumoto, a woman who went missing in 1977 on her way to a knitting class of all things. Megumi Yokota was a little girl who went missing in November 15th of 1977 from Niigata. This was near where Fusako Sano went missing, hence people wondering if the two cases were possibly related. Yaiko Taguchi. She disappeared in 1978 while working at a cabaret club. She was a single mom with two kids, neither of which would ever see her again. Yasushi Chimura and Fukie Hamamoto. A man and woman who both went missing together while near the beach in Obama. Yeah, that's the name of a city. In 1978. 
Later on, Kaoru Hasiuke and Yukiko Okudo, another man and woman who were on the beach in Niigata, went missing that year as well. Then about a month later that same year, Miyoshi Soga and Hitomi Soga, a mother and daughter who were on Sado Island, went missing as well. Rumiko Matsumoto and Shuichi Ichikawa, another man and woman, went missing together in what is now Hioki, a coastline city, in 1978 as well. Toru Ishioka and Kaoru Matsuki, two men, both took a trip to Europe in May of 1980 and both went missing together while visiting Madrid, Spain. Tadaki Hara was a man who disappeared one month later in June of 1980 from Miyazaki, another coastline city. Then finally we have Keiko Arimoto, a woman who disappeared in June of 1983. She actually vanished from Copenhagen, Denmark. She had previously been studying English abroad in London. After taking a trip to Denmark, she was never heard from again. The case of Megumi Yokota, the little girl who was taken from the Niigata prefecture, is probably the most well-known out of all of these cases. She was one of the people who was taken during the peak of the kidnappings in the late 1970s. She was only 13 years old when she went missing while walking home from school in her seaside village, making her the youngest out of any of the victims. It's rumored that, during her walk home, she may have witnessed some North Korean operatives in action, who had no choice but to kidnap her in order to keep their actions a secret. Although the true reason for her being picked specifically is unknown. She was reportedly dragged away to a boat, where she was swiftly taken to North Korea and forced into a facility to learn the Korean language. She was, eventually, taken away to a North Korean university that often taught spies foreign languages, cultures, practices, and customs. Megumi, who was forced to teach Japanese to these operatives, worked there along with a number of captives from South Korea. One of these captives was a man named Kim Young-nam, who would later go on to marry Megumi. Eventually, information of this leaked, and her family was notified of the truth of her disappearance. The North Korean government eventually admitted to her kidnapping, but claimed that she had ended her own life in 1994, and they returned what they claimed to be her cremated remains to Japan. Her husband seemingly confirmed her death himself, but he had often been stated not to be able to speak freely before and seemed to be reading from a script when speaking during interviews. Something very common with captives in North Korea. Megumi had a daughter with her husband, one that has since been kept very close to Kim Jong-il and eventually Kim Jong-un, who they hope to use in negotiations with Japan in the future. Hitomi Soga, who was kidnapped along with her mother, Miyoshi, was also forced to teach Japanese to North Korean operatives. She was separated from her mother shortly after arriving in the country, who she never saw again. She eventually met a man named Charles Robert Jenkins, Jenkins was a defector from the U.S. Army who chose to live in North Korea and give aid to the North Korean government. He was assigned to teach English to Hitomi. They eventually fell for each other and got married, having two daughters together. For decades, there would basically be no progress on getting these victims home, holding North Korea accountable for what they'd done, or even firmly putting the blame on them for the disappearances at all. None of the victims would go on to escape on their own, with many of them either being under too strict of supervision to ever hope to leave, and many others simply residing to their fate and making a life for themselves in North Korea, often getting married, having kids, and giving up on all hope of ever going home. In 2002, the Prime Minister of Japan at the time, a man named Junichiro Koizumi, was a conservative who took a more assertive stance against the communist nation of North Korea. He visited North Korea and met with the big man Kim Jong-il himself in person as part of the first Japan-North Korea summit. Kim, kind of wanting to smooth out the relations between the two countries a bit, made the surprising decision to admit to the abduction of 13 Japanese citizens over the years. Shockingly proving that the conspiracy theory was, in fact, absolutely true. Kim went on to state that, out of all the people who had been kidnapped, many had died. Whether or not he was lying was unclear. However, he did go on to state that, to the shock of many, five of the victims were still alive and well. He even went as far as issuing an apology. We have thoroughly investigated this matter. Decades of adversarial relations between our two countries provided the background of this incident. It was, nevertheless, an appalling incident. 
It is my understanding that this incident was initiated by special mission organization in the 1970s and 80s, driven by blindly motivated patriotism and misguided heroism. As soon as their scheme and deeds were brought to my attention, those who were responsible were punished. I would like to take this opportunity to apologize straightforwardly for the regrettable conduct of those people. I will not allow that to happen again. The North Korean government went on to provide the death certificates for the eight other victims that they claimed had died. The certificates were, admittedly, hastily drafted shortly before handing them over. Because of this, many, including the Japanese government, strongly doubt their legitimacy and question whether or not these victims are actually dead or are being held back as possible gambling chips for future negotiations. Although Kim had intended for his apology to be a gesture of kindness and a proof of his supposed commitment to openness and honesty with the Prime Minister, it's widely believed that he really shot himself in the foot with this confession. Not necessarily morally, but more strategically. The kidnapping allegations were still seen by many to be mere conspiracy theories, after all. If he had said nothing, he might have kept getting away with it forever. But now he opened the door up for more kidnapping allegations and even more questions into his activity. Not only that, but Japan retaliated against North Korea by cutting the very little trade they had and imposing various sanctions. North Korea eventually decided to allow the five kidnapping victims that they claimed to be alive to return to Japan. Temporarily. Kim only allowed them to return on the condition that they would come back to North Korea after. This was nothing short of idiotic, as none of them would end up going back, with the Japanese government basically telling the North Korean government to go to hell on the issue. North Korea then claimed that this violated their agreement, and they refused to talk with them any further. The five who came back were Yasushi Chimura and his wife Fukie, who were both kidnapped together and later married, Kaoru Hasuyuke and his wife Yukiko, and Hitomi Soga, who was forced to return without her husband, Charles Robert Jenkins, or their children. The identities of the five victims were confirmed by various means, such as DNA testing, fingerprints, and dental records. The Prime Minister, Koizumi, eventually returned to North Korea two years later in 2004. Upon doing so, the three children of Yasushi and Fukie Chimura, and the two children of Kaoru and Yukiko Hasuke were allowed to reunite with their parents in Japan. All five of the kids went on to decide to remain in Japan and live as Japanese people. Later that year, the North Korean government decided to send Japan the cremated remains of two of the kidnappings that they claimed had died. Those being the remains of Kaoru Matsuki and Megumi Yokota. Understandably, the Japanese government went on to DNA test these remains, and it was found that neither of them were legitimate. Neither of them belonged to who they were supposed to belong to. However, it was later found that the testing was a bit faulty and had been performed by a junior forensics faculty member who had never tried identifying cremated remains before. Because of this, it's not really known how accurate these tests were. Either way, the resulting commotion just made sure that the relations between Japan and North Korea were just made even worse. In 2006, police in Osaka raided six different facilities that they suspected may have been connected to the disappearances, namely that of Tadaki Hara. All six of the facilities ended up being linked to Chongryon, a pro-North Korean organization in Japan that acts as their de facto embassy as they don't really have any official diplomatic ties to the country. The head of the group was suspected of being complicit in at least Tadaki Hara's abduction. The North Korean government continues to stick with their story, claiming that there were 13 victims in total, no more, and that all of those who were still living were safely returned to Japan. The Japanese government, on the contrary, believes that the issue is anything but resolved, continuing to believe that much of the evidence provided by North Korea is faked. The bulk of the kidnapping victims are still missing, with an even larger pool of suspected victims being missing as well. In 2011, a number of South Korean intelligence agencies reported that a good number of South Korean and Japanese kidnapping victims, dozens in fact, were moved to Wanwa-ri, a city in the South Pyongyang province. They added that among these dozens of people, Yaiko Taguchi, Tadakihara, and Megumi Yokota herself may be present. 
Only a few months later, the world rejoiced as Kim Jong-il breathed his last breath, dying from a heart attack in December of 2011. After his death, Kaoru Hasuke, one of the kidnapping victims who returned to Japan previously, pressured the Japanese government to carefully analyze the state of affairs in North Korea and do its best to secure the safety of abductees still left there. A few years later, in 2013, the families of the still missing victims, including Megami Yokota's family, testified at a UN hearing against North Korea. After this, North Korea agreed to look into the kidnapping cases once again. Because of that, Japan agreed to ease their sanctions just a bit as the two countries resumed talks. Then one year later in 2014, Megami Yokota's parents were finally allowed to meet their granddaughter for the first time in Mongolia. Not only that, but their granddaughter had a daughter of her own that they were overjoyed to meet. Hitomi Soga was eventually able to reunite with her family again as well, with both her husband and her kids. However, they had to do it in a more roundabout way. Her husband, Jenkins, and her daughters agreed to meet with her in Jakarta, Indonesia. They all decided to go back to Japan together. Jenkins reported to a U.S. Army base at Camp Zama in Japan and ended up serving a relatively light prison sentence after being found guilty of desertion and aiding the enemy. He was also understandably formally dishonorably discharged from the army. The family lived together on Sato Island until Jenkins passed away in 2017. Then in 2019, the Japanese government formally announced that another one of the kidnapping victims, Minoru Tanaka, one of the original few victims, had been found. He was believed to have since had gotten married and had children, and was living in Pyongyang with his family. Given that the North Korean government had continued to adamantly deny involvement with his disappearance, this didn't do much for their already very low level of credibility. It is believed by many that these kidnappings were absolutely unnecessary and pointless in the first place, given that many North Korean citizens and Japanese North Korean sympathizers were already living in Japan and speaking Japanese through the Chongryang organization. Given that such an organization already existed and had existed since 1955, uh, there were a lot of people, competent people, who were willing to move to North Korea. So it's really unknown why the North Korean government chose to kidnap so many Japanese citizens in the first place. The current Prime Minister of Japan, Fumio Kishida, has yet to comment on these issues. In conclusion, many of the confirmed kidnapping victims are still missing. Although several of the previously mentioned victims were allowed to return home to Japan in the 2000s, many are still gone without a trace. When it comes to Yukata Kume, Minoru Tanaka, Kyoko Matsumoto, and Miyoshi Soga, the North Korean government denies all involvement entirely. However, Hitomi Soga, Miyoshi's daughter who returned to Japan alive in 2002, says that this claim is bogus, as she was kidnapped together along with her mother. And being that it was also found that Minoru Tanaka was indeed alive and living in Pyongyang in 2019, it's fair to say that their claims of not being involved are less than credible. Many of the victims, allegedly, have long since died in North Korea. These include Keiko Arimoto, Rumiko Matsumoto, Shuichi Ichikawa, Toru Ishioka, Kaoru Matsuki, Tadakihara, and Yaiko Taguchi. However, in the case of Yaiko Taguchi, a North Korean operative and bomber named Kim Hyung-hui has since claimed that she is still alive, meaning that even these claims of death are also very likely not credible. When it comes to Megami Okota, the North Korean government sticks to the assertion that she passed away back in 1994. However, as their evidence was lacking, to say the least, neither her family nor the Japanese government seems to believe this claim. Her father passed away in 2020, never seeing her again. The website for the National Police Agency in Japan still keeps track of the amount of missing persons cases throughout Japan that are thought to be linked to the North Korean government. As of last year in 2021, the number of missing persons who are suspected of being kidnapped by the country is listed as 873. Every once in a while the list is updated to add some new names to the list, but every once in a while it's also updated to remove some names that have found to be completely unrelated to North Korea. The testimonies of many other people who have been kidnapped by North Korea over the years have since been coming out little by little. Many of these people were from European countries, with a couple from the Middle East as well, and a large chunk were from South Korea. 
It's really unknown how many kidnapping victims are in the country of North Korea right now, but it's a pretty solid number at the very least. So once again, thank you for watching my video, and thanks for taking interest in a topic like this. I think it's a first case in quite a while that I've got to cover that wasn't about a singular crime, which is kind of refreshing. If you found the video interesting, please do give it a like. It helps it to get seen by others. I mean, gotta love the algorithm. If you find topics like this interesting, uh, go ahead and subscribe. I do talk about this stuff quite a bit. And if you want to support the channel even further, I do have a Patreon account, which I keep linked in the description below. And speaking of which, shout out to the top patrons. We have AMCMT, Balls, Rick Torres, Farius, Tang, Sash Johnson, Marianne McCurdy, Jewel G, Wafrans, Jules Latona, Arctic Cat, Alan Damiani, Adrian Lawley, David McLaughlin, Marsh, Buffa Zerk, Jewel Mav Chan, Rinsenstein, Kim Peek, Lux Alpaca, Charity, Skooky Mane, Jackie, Tracer Ferguson, and Mark Barnett. I thank you all from the bottom of my cold, dead heart and half of my kidney. Thank you, and good night.